Welcome back, everybody, to our second Q&A with Nick. Sorry it took so long to get to this. I was a little under the weather. You know, stuff just doesn't always line up right. But uh, we are back. So these are questions from almost two weeks ago on Instagram. So I put them in my stories. If people want to ask questions, it's easier for Nick and I, at least for me, to find them on Instagram. And then I can take a yeah. screenshot, and then we can answer them here. Um, it's not to say you can't ask them down below. I don't always get a time to log into YouTube and respond to comments, so I apologize for that. I figured to keep the format pretty standard and make it flow easy, I'll read the question, Nick can answer it. If if I have something to add, I'll add. If Nick doesn't want to answer it, he can pass it to me and I'll, I'll give my attempt. I apologize. I didn't really have a ton of time to look at these beforehand, so I hope my answers are adequate. Um, so I guess we'll start with the first one. Um, yeah. How to tell whether to add cardio or decrease food in prep. And he says nuances are welcome. So I guess he doesn't care if we talk about individual stuff. That's good, yeah, because it's definitely individual specific. And I think I think you'd probably agree with me on that. Like when it comes to whether you decrease food or increase cardio, one, you have to consider where your current calorie intake is sitting. Two, are you currently doing any kind of cardio or are you not doing any? And I mean, if you're not doing any cardio, and food is reasonably high i mean or even if it's very high i think the logical step if food's incredibly high is to just make an adjustment to nutrition um if food's already on its way down i'd say probably introduce a bit of cardio because you it's about it's a balancing act the way i see it you want to kind of try mm -hmm. extend the runway as long as possible because if you tank out of calories too soon by just cutting calories 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 you're shortening your runway, then all of a sudden you have to have a diet break, a plan maintenance phase, build calories back up before you can continue the deficit. And if you're in a time crunch or if you say prepping for a contest and you have a deadline, you've there's more strategy involved. You've got to think about how you're going to get from your starting point to the, the finish line. And so I'd say, yeah, uh, depending on calorie yeah, level, either reduce calories or introduce cardio. And then another thing too is if you're already doing cardio, uh, don't just continually add more and more cardio because the body does something a lot of people overlook is the body becomes more efficient as you increase expenditure. Very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. And I mean, it's something like, say for example, you're burning an additional 50 to 100 calories per thousand steps per day. Uh, that might be the case up until about 10,000 steps per day. Then every um, thousand steps up beyond that, you're probably looking at about half the amount of calorie expenditure per thousand steps. So it, you might be looking to say from 10, 10,000, say maybe like 9,000 steps to 10,000 steps per day, you're burning an additional 100 calories a day. Mm -hmm. Then from nine, uh, from 10,000 steps to 12,000 steps, you might be burning an additional 100 calories a day. So it, it kind of like exponentially gets more and more efficient as expenditure goes up. So just because you say might burn 1,000 calories a day from 10,000 steps, doesn't mean you're going to burn 2,000 from 20,000. It's probably more like 1,500. Um, you need to keep that in mind. So same thing applies to actual formal cardio if you're doing it on the spin bike or elliptical or stairs. So you want to make sure that you're not just playing the the increased cardio card too much. Otherwise, you're going to run yourself into a hole in terms of recovery. Training performance is going to suffer. And that's a more important factor. I think if you can't maintain your strength and your performance in your gym, uh, in your gym sessions when you're in a deficit, then you're a high risk of muscle loss, especially as a natural um, drug induced, like enhanced individuals. The parameters are a bit wider. You can kind of get away with doing pretty stupid shit. But if you're drug free, if you're natural, you have to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, the only two things I would add is, I would say just as a general rule, most people should do some level of cardio all the time, just for general health. Um, and I usually look at someone's genetics when I determine initially at least which it's going to be food or cardio that I would move around. So guys that tend to be heavier naturally, I would usually pull the cardio card more or harder. Uh, and guys like myself that tend to be a little leaner naturally and probably lose muscle faster. I would personally, I'd manipulate the food. I tend to lose more size fast if I do too much cardio. There's that fine line, right? I think anyone who's gotten really lean probably gotten leaner while doing some level of cardio. It's not to say you can't without cardio, but cardio definitely uh, upregulates some enzymes and does some things that just moving the food is not going to do alone. Um, okay, the next question. Okay. 
So this is a uh, he wrote it in two parts because it was longer. Can a bodybuilder use testosterone as a sole anabolic during the off season? As in, can testosterone be pushed to two to three grams a week while controlling for E2 in the off season? So he's just wondering if like it's your off season and you just want to use testosterone, could you do it? It's doable. And I mean, <clears throat> for the large majority of people who are enhanced, maybe they're not looking to be a pro level bodybuilder. I'd say, honestly, just sticking with bioidentical hormones like testosterone is probably the best way to go. It's predictable for starters. It's least likely to be faked. And so you're more likely to be getting what you think you're getting. And like I said, back to the predictability aspect of it, it can aromatize into uh, estradiol. Uh, the conversion to DHT is pretty fixed. I mean, that's not going to vary much. Uh, it's a pretty kind of standardized kind of uh, rate of conversion but when it comes to estradiol there is a lot of individual variance there so I mean if you're somebody that doesn't aromatize a lot you can probably push it up to 2-3 grams a, a week and not have any issues but if you're somebody that aromatizes a lot then you're probably going to need an AI and how much of an AI is going to be determined by blood work you're going to have to get that done body fat levels will influence it genetics as well so whether your parents are high aromatizers or not that's going to have a, a amplitude to it but I'd say yeah, just you're going to have to get blood work to find out if you can do it, although it's definitely doable. Yeah, I, yeah I'd yeah, i agree. I'd say from a chemical point of view, when we modified the testosterone molecule to make supposedly better hormones, we lost something in that process. Uh, there's a reason why test is considered best. Um, there seems to be some level, though, of maximum usability or effectiveness for most people that I've run into. I've talked to this with John Jewett. I've talked to this with Paul Barnett. Everyone seems to have some sort of set top limit. And really, once you go above there, it's just side effects. So, so I would say, depending on your level and your experience with gear, I, I believe in the old school thing that you would run tests. You know, you continue to titrate, titrate test up until you reach a point where it's no longer doing what you intend. And then you add something on top versus what a lot of the guys doing because of more plates, more dates, is they're leaving their testosterone basically at some sort of TRT level and they're adding another anabolic. I, I'm not really of that school of thought personally. I'm kind of of the, you know, the 90s or before where you would leverage test first heavier. Um, I don't know personally a ton of guys that can run three grams of test without side effects. It, regardless if you're controlling for E2 or not, E2 would definitely be controlled with three grams. Um, it seems for most guys that it's somewhere between 750 and 1500 seems to be where they tap out of effectiveness of testosterone alone. So if you're not growing, the, the point of me saying this is if you're not, if you're at the point where you're no longer growing new tissue at 1500 milligrams of testosterone alone, then it's probably time to look at adding something else in there. Um, I would also look at food though, because a lot of times it's not a gear issue. It's a food issue for most guys, you know, yeah. not just quantity, but the quality of the food, right? You, big, you know, yeah, I mean, big, big I know, that I, I, I know you don't leverage anywhere near three grams a test. You're a pretty big no, dude. Yeah. You know? So I'm, I'm one of the unfortunate few. I, I do aromatize quite heavily. So my tap out point is pretty, pretty low with testosterone. So someone who aromatizes a lot, like Kurt was saying, is going to be somebody that would have to probably introduce a, a second compound sooner um, up the, on, on the milligram titration uh, process. So yeah, uh, but, but food, like Kurt said, I agree. Food is probably the, the lowest hanging fruit where I see people kind of fall short. Like you'll find people, they'll escalate the dose and they forget that that has an impact on your energy expenditure. And a lot of the time their metabolic rate will, uh, I guess you could say outwork or exceed their uh, current energy intake. And they, they don't consider that. They think, oh, it must be a dose issue. But no, it's just, you've gone from 500 milligrams a week to 1500 milligrams a week. Now you're energy expenditure or your energy needs are 700 to a thousand calories more a day it might be something as simple as that yeah yeah you need the raw materials so mm. it's generally and, and like you said the micronutrients too like the the vitamins and stuff very important for metabolism at the cellular level to make sure everything's kind of functioning properly so this one's an opinion question i know this guy yes he he's been interacting with me a lot on instagram if i had to choose between two compounds in a bulk would you choose Test. I know. I know what your answer is going to be, but I think it's interesting. Test and Deca, 
or test and primo. Mm. Definitely test deck of Debo, right? No. <laughs> no. Uh, test and primo, definitely. They're okay. going to have a more complementary effect, especially as you titrate them up at higher doses. Okay. I'll go the opposite. I'll say test and deca. I'm, I'm a yeah. thin guy. I have no problem yeah. with progesterones. Uh, yeah. I don't want to aromatize heavily. You know, just for the sake of argument. I mean, you could use yeah. either. I, I yeah. primo to the me point, the problem the is a bit of a. A moot point. It's like you basically it's going to be person dependent. It's person, yeah. yeah and the like, I think unless you're willing to spend a lot of money and a lot of use a lot of oil, the problem with premium bond is it becomes it's it's actually strong in a milligram dose. Most people don't use enough of it. It would it's the same as if you looked at 300 milligrams of testosterone. If you want to get huge, you're not going to use 300 milligrams of testosterone. You're not going to use 300 milligrams of primo. So it's it becomes inefficient. Like it becomes a financial issue more than an effectiveness issue with Prima Bond. I think Prima Bond is actually a strong drug on a milligram basis. It's just that it tends to be sold as 100 milligrams per ml because of the cost to manufacture the raw. Um, so, different, so something different to think about there. I think if you've never done either it, and you're at that stage where you're past testosterone only, maybe try one of each. See how you feel. It's the only way you're ever going to know. And pull bloods too. See how you respond. Yeah, I mean that's how ninety nine percent of guys learn, right? Is they yeah. experiment. Trial and error. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's like the, the only way you can find out. So the next one is a compli. I'm reading it as a complicated question. I don't know. It, it, I don't know exactly what the what specifically he's looking for. I can try to answer the question the best I can. Uh, you and I talked about this one beforehand because I asked if it was something you wanted to deal with or not. I think you said you did not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he asked if there will be upregulation of intermuscular ketoreductases when DHT derivatives are used for prolonged amount of time. So um, the, he's talking about the keto aldo reductase system, which is part of steroid metabolism. Uh, I I'm going to say. On a side note, my guess is he's concerned with things like prostate cancer because that's typically why any normal person would care about this. Uh, it should not be upregulated because of DHT derivatives because they are 5-alpha reduced and generally keto aldo deals with uh, 3, 5, 7, 17, and 20 carbon and generally on the beta side of 5. So they're generally 5-beta reduced things. Like it is responsible for 5-beta reduction of testosterone and 5-beta reduction of progesterone. And so it shouldn't have, it, it shouldn't, DHT derivatives like a Mastron or Primo Bond. Um, although there is some 3-oxo, uh, you know, degradation that occurs, I don't believe there should be any upregulation of that enzyme. And a lot of that is tissue specific and environmental specific, and we don't fully understand. It's one of the things if we, if we fully understood what was going on there with steroid metabolism, it would bring us a lot closer to a cure for cancer, at least hormone um, modulated cancer. Okay, let's go to a simpler one. If that person who asked that question needs something more specific, they could DM me on Instagram. I don't know. Um, I'm guessing it's a question that you would typically only ask if you kind of understood the answer because it's a very complicated question. So if they want more or they need help working through something, uh, they can ask me. Um, the next, oh, this one's directed at me. I can do this real fast. Someone just asked what my, so my updated opinion on Mastron was. So recently I put a video up on, on Instagram stating that I had changed my stance on Mastron. I do these things because I'm, I'm trying to stay honest in a world where everyone seems to just get stuck on things and have confirmation bias. I, it's not fully that it's changed. I was just clarifying my stance. I said initially that it's not that it doesn't grow muscle. There's just very little data to show that it grows muscle and there's no data in men. So there is some data in women that shows with cancer, they basically, instead of sarcopenia, they experience a slight gain in some lean tissue mass. So you could say, well, if it happens in women, it happens in men, sure. There's just no data in men. And I never said it didn't grow tissue. I'm just saying it's never been shown, right? So we can't also make the assumption that it's safe. I don't know where that came from. Uh, and and again i'm not saying it's not safe we just can't make it like we can't take this and go here um and i still don't think it's an efficient choice 
And if you actually look at the context of what guys like John Jupiter say about it, it's in the stuff that I don't know if, if, if people are on J3U and they saw before and after pictures of guys on these lower test, high master on low 19 door cycles, and they gained a bunch of tissue. There's a couple things behind the scenes that were not posted. One, these guys are very new. So there was a lot of tissue to accrue. Uh, that also explains why their testosterone dose was low because they were not used to higher doses in testosterone. And Masteron was used because it was difficult for these people to obtain prima volum that was legitimate. So, and John has said this to me himself, that it's not that he prefers Masteron, it's that if he has trouble sourcing prima volum that's verified as prima volum, he will go with Masteron because it's really faked. So I think this is where kind of the confusion is. It's not that these guys want to run test and Masteron, it's that they're running it in the absence of genuine prima volum. So, and, and that's all I'm saying is I would choose test and primaval and over test and Masteron if I were trying to gain tissue. If you're in a cutting phase, sure, Masteron has, to me, it's more valuable there. I don't know if you have anything to add. No, no, I, th I think, yeah, what you said was right on the money. I mean, I, I recall John Jewett mentioning somewhere, it might have been one of his YouTube videos, that he recently swapped out uh, some Masteron for some Primo because he managed to find some real Primo. And it just goes to show you there, like even John Jewett, the the so-called, I guess you could say, Mastron guy in the industry also prefers Primo. Uh, so it's more of a beggars can't be choosers situation, I think. That's that's why he's kind of resorted to that. And like like you said, I mean, you're not kind of changing your stance on Mastron. You're just clarifying the, the details because people are misunderstanding what you said. Yeah. And you wanted to make sure that people didn't, I suppose, run off with the, the wrong idea of what you were saying. Yeah. I think, and I know you're similar, I think it's very important for me to stay on it. Like I'm trying to stay as honest as I can in all these situations. And I know that I'm perceived in a certain way, you know, as a, in certain situations, authority, I might be perceived as an expert or an authority on things. And I wanna make sure that I'm mm -hmm. staying accurate in what I say. And I know that there's things on forums where people will debate things that I've said. I wanna make sure that the context is clear, that I'm not saying something that can be misinterpreted. Um, yeah, that's really it. I just there's just no need. I'm not going to get stuck on a statement if if I my thought changes on it or, you know, if if it's being misunderstood. So the next question is: It possible to mitigate or reverse dopaminergic or serotonergic changes caused by 19 nor? So like nandrolone, trembolone, if they change neurotransmitter function in the human brain, is it possible to change those after the fact? Want to go? Yeah, I, I suppose, yeah. We, we kind of spoke about this briefly one-on-one -on -one prior to this episode. And I mean, we're both on this similar kind of grounds that it, it's most likely from what we can tell just short-term acute changes. And once you cease use of the, the compound and it's basically been discontinued for a while, you, you're going to have a restoration of, of normal kind of neurological function. Yeah. I mean, obviously, unless there was some sort of damage that occurred before or some chemical imbalance, right? If you have an illness that, you know, makes your yeah. serotonin off. I, but again, I don't know why you're you using these steroids yeah. in that case. Yeah. If you, if you had bipolar disorder or something like that, then it's potential that it could trigger something. But I mean, say, just assume you're neurotypical. There shouldn't really be any kind of yeah. adverse long-term effects. Yeah. Like I know Colton, for instance, and I, I, don't, I know he doesn't mind me saying this, he was you know, generous enough with his time that he was in the armed forces for the United States and he's experienced some PTSD from his time overseas. And I know that he struggles with things like 19 Norse because of that. So it's just to say, if you are already, if you already have a known situation there, maybe these aren't the wise things to do. No. Uh, user beware. Uh, okay. The next one. Adding 22 to 25 pounds of mostly lean tissue in 18 weeks possible. I'm guessing they're arguing with someone and they're trying to resolve an argument. Because <laughs> it's a very specific amount of tissue in a very specific amount of time. Yeah. And you gain 25 pounds of pure muscle tissue in 18 weeks. <laughs> uh, depends on what he's defining with the pure muscle tissue and how, how new the person is, if they're a genetic phenom or not. Like, I mean, the way I see it, for every kilogram of body weight or lean body mass, let's just assume you gain... 0.5 to 1 gram of muscle tissue per week per kilogram of body weight. So 100 kilo individual, 50 to 100 grams of actual 
contractile tissue, not including the water weight alongside it, but 50 to 100 grams of contractile tissue a week for like a beginner is pretty typical. So, I mean, extrapolate that. I mean, factor in the fact that muscle tissue is about 70-ish percent or like three quarters water. I mean, you're probably looking at like a few hundred grams in most scenarios a week of actual tissue gain as a beginner. Uh, if you're enhanced for the first time, you could see that rate of gain at return initially. Uh, again, there's a lot of genetic variance here, but let's just for, for argument's sake, just say roughly 300 grams a week. We look at your time frame of 18 weeks. What's that like? Looking at about five to six kilos of muscle. Um, it's not even close. So I, I don't think it's very likely. I think it's, it's very, very um, optimistic. Let's just say that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Kevin Lavroni probably could. <laughs> Uh, yeah. it's yeah I'd agree I, I would say uh, pure tissue no uh, could you move the scale that much sure is that like that's just not if you if you actually I, I don't remember the math you might know better than me if to add to actual 25 pounds of pure tissue would move the scale probably 40 pounds up because of the blood right the extra mm. there's connective tissue growth there's all sorts of other things that go into this glycogen yeah. um, so uh, not a pure tissue you could definitely yeah. move this scale by 25 pounds 25 pounds for the average guy uh, again outside of a beginner it seems to be the average guy you know and even guys like nick walker it seems to be about 10 solid pounds a year is what mm -hmm. most dudes will gain on a you know on a consistent basis and really outside of that you just don't see it the first it's it, and it's not always 10 even it's usually you know it could be more the first year that it goes like this and then down you know someone my age might be a pound a year two pounds a year it really slows down at a certain point um but there's no steroid cycle anyone's going to do outside of being a newbie it's even going to move the scale by that much yeah right um it, <laughs> yeah, you know but again that's not pure tissue either yeah post show you might get that much bloat <laughs> uh the next question i'm just trying to make sure i understand it best use of ai with least known long-term side effects um i think i understand I what he's asking he's he, well, one of two things he's either asking which out of the aromatase inhibitors available is the best safest one or okay. which which method is the safest method at implementing an ai oh, okay we could do both one if you want to yeah yeah <clears throat> uh based based on like my personal experience what i've seen in terms of the, I guess you could say the, the literature on them, I would lean more towards the Romicin, Exemestane, or Arimidex. I wouldn't use anything else. Um, again, in terms of how to best implement it, you want to use a minimum amount required, obviously. That, that should always be the goal with any ancillaries. I mean, if you're taking a drug and then taking another drug to control the side effects of the drug, you probably need to reevaluate how you're taking the first drug in the first place, whether you should be using that much or maybe using, uh, leveraging a different kind of anabolic alongside that. Um, Cause usually it'll, I mean, it's just indicative of excess aromatization. Like you put an AI in there to control that, keep your estriol in a physiologic range. So, I mean, if, if it's blown out of the charts, maybe just reevaluate how you're structuring your cycle. But yeah, AI lowest possible dose and I'd say you, the, the safest way, honestly, like if, you, if you're in tune with your body enough and you get regular blood work, say e, E2 levels tested once a month, is to literally, once you kind of find your baseline, just take half a tablet whenever you feel like you're getting a little bit of water retention, a little bit of sensitivity, something like that. That's probably the best way to go about it. That way you're reactively using it and it's probably going to reduce the total amount of drug mm -hmm. used. But yeah, what do you have to add on it? Uh, I mean, I don't disagree. The only thing I've seen in practice is aromacin. Aromacin on paper looks like it's a great drug, right? Super, you know, mm -hmm. it's a lot safer, less cholesterol issues. I've not personally seen anyone who's used aromatized who's been able to successfully manage their E2, though. I don't know if you have any different experience. From people that I do calls with, typically when they're having E2 issues and they're using aromacin, it still seems to be runaway E2. Uh, so when you look at these drugs, just so people understand, Aromacin is considered a suicide inhibitor, so it's basically killing the estrogen receptor in theory. 
there's actually a new class of drugs called the degraders that are we're working on now that will kind of replace that class. Um, you really have the two AIs that are commonly available that are FDA approved are letrozole and arimidex. And I would typically go with arimidex, like you said, over letrozole. Although this data shows that they seem to be equal in their outcome from both bodybuilders and cancer patients, the outcome seems different. Letrozole seems stronger and harsher with its side effects. The only thing to keep in mind, again, I don't have any bodybuilding data on it, but with cancer patients, there seems to be something that occurs at five years where the body kind of gets used to things like arimidex. And it's generally, it, it, at least in cancer, it, you're generally instructed to the, to come off of the arimidex for a period of time. And then it can be revisited later if there's still you know a possibility of risk. But um, I'll assume it would be similar in someone with bodybuilding. It's just we are not a study class, so I really can't say that. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, the, Arimidex has been used for a long period of time and, you know, with minimal damage done when used correctly for, for years and years and years. So uh, generally, as long as, like you said, as long as you're looking at your blood work and you're not just haphazardly taking things and it's in need, right? You're actually at a place where you actually need to manage your estrogen. That, you know, I, I would go with Remedex. Um, yeah. Curious. <clears throat> Okay, this is another one. It's kind of going back to what it said again. It's just directed at me. Someone said, curious what your new thoughts on Mastron are after discussing with John. So it's what I said before. Uh, I just, I was, I was just making sure people understood that I never said it didn't grow muscle. It can grow muscle. I don't think it's an efficient choice. I think if you look at things like ment, like vigorous Steve said, or nandrolone, or testosterone, the milligrams can be much lower to grow an equal amount of tissue. Versus something like Mastron, which seems to have to be, you know, almost in the gram quantity to grow an equal amount of tissue. So I, you know, I just don't think it's efficient. And John basically said what I said before. John said, you know, in the presence of real, genuine Primobol, and he would opt for Primobol and for muscle growth over Mastron. Um, and, and I would agree with that. And I was just putting that out there to clarify that I was never saying that it doesn't. Proviron, though, on the other hand, most likely doesn't grow any muscle tissue. Yeah. Um, and, and it just goes to show you that the new data on genetics on the genes that steroids interact with show that all steroids do not grow muscle at the same rate they do not grow muscle through the same mechanisms there's a ton of different there's 88 genes that, that, that are affected and they all work slightly different um and so that just because on in theory in the 1950s they did things with nitrogen retention and they all showed somewhat similar nitrogen retention that is only part of the story that's anti-catabolism that's not showing necessarily protein synthesis or gene expression or non-genomic things or any of the other things that steroids are going to do. That's, that's a whole different category. Um, where uh, this could be interesting because you, because you don't live in the United States. So this could be for people who don't live here. Where do you recommend getting the best labs? Um, I know of Merrick, but I'm curious of other options. Like where do you, like if you want labs, where are you going? Honestly, I just go to any private um, pathology. Okay. I, I just uh, there's a lot of online pathologies uh, over here, and I'm sure that they they are in Australia. And so if they're in Australia, I can guarantee they're in the states. You probably just need to do some googling. But yeah. honestly, it's not. It doesn't really matter who you go through to get your blood work. In my opinion, as long as it's reasonably priced, it's who you get to interpret your blood work. So you get your blood work, but then make sure you don't have a complete moron interpreting your blood work. Otherwise, what good is it? If you know how to interpret your blood work, you don't need to worry about where you get it from because ultimately you just want the, the tests done. You can't do the tests yourself. You just want the results so you can read through them and make sure everything's fine. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I I use my regular doctor. I have a good relationship with him. Uh, I also have the ability, if, if anyone watching this needs labs done and they don't have another place to go, if they schedule like a 30-minute consult with me, I can send them, uh, you know, a script through a, a, a clinician that I partner with, you know, for LabCorp. So if someone needs help with labs, that way I can review them. Um, and you don't need to deal with if you have a doctor that's being pesky and bothering you about things or doesn't seem to understand the nuances that go on with bodybuilding blood work. Um, I will be more than happy to help you. Uh, you can get, you know, purchase a call on my website, atomiclifecoaching.com. Um, see. Let's see where we are. Okay, you you know what? 
did you ever we'll do this as the we'll do we'll do two more did you ever see or hear of anyone using thyroid medicine during a growth phase does it have an application mm. okay yeah uh there is certain instances where it might be warranted i think a lot of people haphazardly throw thyroid medication in these days though because of the I guess you could say the PED courses <laughs> that have been out there for a couple of years, um, the the membership sites. I I don't think that everybody needs thyroid medication just because you're on growth hormone doesn't mean that you need it. If you genuinely look at your blood work and your TSH is like shot, potentially adding in some exogenous thyroid while you're on a cycle, while your growth hormone is at such a dose at which your thyroid axis is suppressed and there might be a reason for it, but I, I don't think a lot of people need it. I really don't. I would just, uh, yeah, I, I'm in total agreement. I, thyroid is one of those areas that can be very fragile and temperamental. I, I'm i not a huge fan of people self-diagnosing thyroid issues and self-medicating with thyroid stuff. I think if you are unsure if you need to be using this during a growth phase or, or even a dieting phase, I would suggest that you either partner with a doctor or a coach that actually understands these drugs because you could do a lot of damage uh, yeah. and potentially you know, cause harm to yourself long term. Um, the only people that I've ever seen that needed it in a growth phase are people that actually had thyroid issues, right? Like Dallas McCarver had mm. thyroid cancer, I believe, mm. and he was using it all the time. But that's, you know, kind of an exception. Also, he's so probably kind of great thing to follow because he's dead. What came first, the chicken and the egg? Because, I mean, if you exactly. jack up thyroid levels too much with exogenous thyroid medication, that can cause thyroid cancer. So yeah. it's and funny, I, eh? Yeah, and I just said, and he's dead. So I don't know if I would follow yeah. anything. <laughs> for carbon really. And he was also on 17 grams a gear a week. So, yeah. Exactly. Rest right. in peace. But, but, yeah, no, I think also to quickly add to that, I mean, in a dieting phase, I think it would probably have more application if at any point. And that might be, say, if you're like running to the ground, like very diet fatigued at a point, say, where your uh, endogenous thyroid function has downregulated quite a bit and you want to kind of maintain a physiologic level, maybe doing a, an appropriate replacement dose while you finish off um, the, the deficit and then taper off the thyroid medication post show as you're titrating food back up. It could potentially have merit. But again, you want to be working with the actual physician, I think, if you're going to go down that route. Yeah. Actually, we could do two more. There's only two more questions. We can do these two more. I think mm -hmm. this next one will be interesting because I think you and I are going to answer differently. And, and I think what is interesting about this is it kind of shows two things. I think it shows that there's many ways to skin a cat. And I also think that in enhanced lifters, as I've said before, that training might be the least important variable. As far as what you do, as far as training, obviously you have to train. You're not injecting testosterone and sitting on the couch. I think that people, I think in natural lifters, I think it's a fascinating subject. I think human muscle hypertrophy is, is really amazing. I I think with guys, what once you've crossed that side, I, I'm not really sure. That it, because if there was only one good way to do it, then everyone would do the same thing. And unfortunately, everyone does not do the same thing, regardless yeah. of what they say. Uh, so the person's question with that being said is how do you structure your training intensity and volume? You can go ahead. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is an interesting one. I'm doing, or well, I'm trying to, if I don't screw up my schedule, AM and PM sessions again. So essentially how somebody might do say a six day week legs push pull split. I, I'll do the big body part in the morning and then the small body part in the evening. So on a push day, or it's not quite a legs push pull. The way I've got it set up is uh, chest in the AM, arms in the evening, uh, then back. Oh, sorry, no, uh, quads in the AM the next day, glutes and hamstrings. Oh, sorry, no, glutes and hamstrings in the morning, quads in the evening uh, as a second day, and then the third day is back in the morning and delts in the evening, and then I'll basically repeat that twice and have one rest day a week. Uh, occasionally I might reactively put in a second rest day, say after one kind of three day cycle of the training, it just ultimately depends on my recovery that week and that sort of thing. So it's a little bit reactive, but basically a higher volume approach, uh, and a quite a high frequency training approach. I still train relatively hard, although I'd probably say I'm leaving a little bit in reserve. Uh, so it's nothing like Dorian Yates style or anything like that, 
although yeah i mean uh, moderate high volume high frequency that's how i do things okay um i do i i've done many 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 different things everything from you know what, what you just I, I don't know if i've ever done it twice a day uh, but I've done everything from higher volume, you know, avian silly stuff like German volume training uh, oh, that's to, <laughs> um, I mean, I've been training for 36 years. I'll fix that battery. I'll just pause and I'll cut this out. Uh. <clears throat> there we go. Back. Cool. Okay. So I've done everything you know, every possible extreme, I would say, uh, from, you know, dog crap training to high German volume training. Um, I personally, at the moment, train. So uh, on a side note, generally intensity and volume are, you know, opposites, right? As you bring in, the volume up, it has to come volume. down. I don't know anyone who's running at, you know, 100% intensity with, you know, tons of volume. Um, yeah. On a side note, so people understand, your your ability to add more volume or the requirement to add more volume is not a, is not a sign of great exercise genetics it's actually a sign of more type 1 slow twitch fiber because you have more you have less fatigability in your fibers and you have more endurance fibers i tend to be a little more fast twitch i don't have a tolerance for a lot of high volume stuff i don't really make progress when i've done that so i at the moment and i will probably being almost 50 this is and I don't really need to get, I have really no intention of getting any bigger. Um, I currently train, I lift weights Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I do cardio on Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, and I take Saturday completely off. I spend a total of three hours a week in the gym. So um, I actually, my strength and my recovery have improved. Uh, my food is more around maintenance, so I, I can't honestly say if I am gaining any weight or not. Um, I'm also not trying to grow anymore. I'm 5'7", 215 with single digit body fat at near 50. I don't know if I really need to be any bigger than that. Uh, I'm of the school of thought if I can't run at least a mile at a decent pace, I'm in pretty poor shape. So I, I try to, you know, my goal at this point is to look as good as I can within reason without harming my health and be alive long enough to see my children get married and have children of their own. So if being 260 pounds at five foot seven was doable, then perhaps I would do that, but unfortunately it would probably kill me. So um, so we kind of do opposite things, right? So it just shows that like, and how, what's your weight? So my, my weight is at the moment about 270. Okay, and what's your height? Two, uh, six foot. Okay. So, so I'm gonna do some math, because so people can understand the standard equation. It's where they come up classic physique body weight, like the, the caps. Is it's yeah. generally about 10 pounds per inch is a pretty standard for most guys. I mean, you have bone differences and, and things like that, but to have the similar look. So two guys can stand on stage next to each other, they're different heights, and they should roughly be the same in appearance. So, mm -hmm. so wait, five would be 50. Okay, so technically, a go, uh, by this formula, and assuming body fat's equated and, and everything else be equal, uh, there, in order for me to have the, to keep my look at your height, I'd have to gain 55 pounds of muscle, which would put me at your weight. So technically, if you and I stood together on stage, we should have an almost identical look, give or take, mm, which makes definitely. sense. And the reason why I brought that up is so people can understand and say, well, he's much smaller than him. There's a big difference in height. So just so people yeah. can understand. So my point is that regardless of what you're doing, most guys kind of net out the same, right? There's not generally large variances in, you yeah. know. When you look at fat-free mass index and stuff, yeah. So exactly. it's just, and that's Nick and I are people similar only, size. He's just much taller than I yeah. am. Yeah, people don't account for height. That's a big, uh, big pitfall, yeah. I think, of a lot of people when they're doing this sort of stuff, comparing yeah. themselves to others. So... Um, the last question, kind of an interesting one. Um, your opinion on high growth hormone three times a week versus low five times or every day per week? You can go ahead. So the, the way I'd approach this is if you're susceptible to side effects from growth hormone, like water retention, getting carpal tunnel issues like that, 
decreasing your administration frequency can have a positive effect on that, mitigating it. Uh, one of my clients, he was having issues with carpal tunnel, waking up with like burning arms and stuff when he was doing growth hormone every day and not even a high dose, two to four hours a day. I said, let's just switch it to every other day and just double the dose. Did that, immediately went away. So I think it's from, from a, a f efficacy side of things, like it doesn't really fucking matter because we're after the IGF-1, the downstream effects of growth hormone, not growth hormone itself, unless if you're say leveraging it for fat loss in a contest prep, in which case there might be some merit in having two doses a day, maybe, but just one small dose uh, around the middle of the day and then the bigger bolus before bed still best, I think. Uh, but yeah, if you're in a growing phase and just take it all before bed, either every day or every other day is pretty reasonable. Yeah, literally exactly what he said. I don't think it really matters, at least in HIV. And the, the problem with growth hormone is there's not a ton of research done on us. There's like one or two studies done on healthy individuals and they're not bodybuilders. Uh, with HIV, like you said, when there are side effects experienced, the dose is not changed, the frequency is changed. If then there's still a side effect issue, the drug is removed. Now, again, that's that's in AIDS, it's not in bodybuilders. But that being said, we're like just like you said, we're after IGF. So you might lose some of the growth hormone effect by going every other day, but the IGF is still there and just elevated. And in all the growth charts I've seen, the growth between every other day and every day is pretty similar. That being said, the five days, I'm not the five days a week thing, the Monday through Friday, the weekends off or whatever, whatever what you're doing. That's just really for bodybuilders for to save money. That there's no advantageous reason to use it for five days versus seven or every other. It's the five is just made up for cost. It's guys like Dorian Yates in that time period when growth hormone was very expensive and hard to come by. That's why they did it. And Dorian has admitted that. And that you know, Jay Cutler said these this is a known thing. Yeah. The whole five days on, two days off. There is no health marker that's changed by doing that um mm. and the other health but the health marker that is changing you did bring up a good point and i've said this before if you experience blood sugar issues from growth hormone doing it pre-bed seems to alleviate most of those if you still experience blood sugar issues the dose needs to be titrated down or you need to remove the growth hormone from your routine because it can cause yeah. things like diabetes if used in people that are prone to this yeah exactly uh, one other thing i was going to say too is uh I was on the topic of, uh, what was it? Oh yeah, the, the five days a week. So the, just to add a little bit more to that, a lot of it had to do with the fact that recombinant technology is a, a lot newer back then and places like China and stuff weren't really manufacturing growth hormone in the, like the generic sense. Like it was more just the pharmacies that had growth hormone back then. And I mean, on top of that too, I mean, we have the internet now. It was a lot, a lot harder to get connections back then, I think too. So it's like the, the source ability and the fact that the the technology used to synthesize exogenous growth hormone was far newer in its infancy stages. It just wasn't as yeah feasible. Like you had to pay more for a product. It wasn't as readily available. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say, you know, use it as you choose. I don't think the weekly dose, just like testosterone, just like any drug, the weekly dose, just like food, like calories, the weekly amount matters much more than the acute amounts. Yeah. Um, you know, that be, you and I have done many, many videos on growth hormone and the dosing. And, you know, I have an entire book on this stuff. Uh, so I'm not going to go into all that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, use it. Weekly use it averages is weekly averages is where it's at, like you said. I mean, it's just our human mind that wants to work on this 24 hour clock. But like biology doesn't work on this kind of like, yeah, biology is kind of like just constant thing so yeah, yeah this we have like a thing. circadian rhythm but that's not that's not necessarily yeah. doing with this kind of stuff um yeah, that's to do a sleep yeah cool so uh send us your next questions we can hopefully get this done in less time on next weekend uh nick is a coach he lives in thailand but he coaches internationally um uh, i will put his link tree down below like we do normally uh if people need supplements, uh, you can use my discount code at First Detachment Nutrition. The code is Kurt10. Um, we have an anabolics course for sale on anabolicbodybuilding.com that goes further into the physiology and the pharmacology of anabolic steroids specifically. And I have a growth hormone book available for sale at atomiclifecoaching.com. And I am a coach. I do consultation calls. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Please like and subscribe. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.